and we are on the air and you are listening to the Hallie Kesser Jane show. Let's talk. And I am Hallie Kesser Jane. Welcome to my listeners in the United States and around the world. Tune in to the Hallie Kesser Jane show at HallieKesserJane.com. This week on the Hallie Kesser Jane show, we're taking a trip to the gray zone when we explore that mysterious place between life and death with two people who are experts on the subject, world-renowned neuroscientist Dr. Adrian Owen, the author of a riveting new book, Into the Gray Zone, a neuroscientist explores the border between life and death, and Dr. Eben Alexander, renowned academic neurosurgeon and author of Proof of Heaven, a neurosurgeon's journey into the afterlife an eminent neuroscientist and an eminent neurosurgeon with two eminently different points of view on consciousness and what it means to be alive. I promise you, true, truly astonishing conversations today on the Hallie Kesser Jane Show. Let's get to it. In one of the most profound books of the year thus far, Into the Gray Zone, world-renowned neuroscientist Dr. Adrian Owen takes his readers on a vivid, emotional, and thought-provoking journey in which he explores the little-understood boundary between life and death. No cold scientific treatise this. Into the Gray Zone is a dazzling glimpse at a new frontier in our scientific understanding of the brain and the newly discovered zones in the twilight region between full consciousness and brain death. Dr. Owen's storytelling abilities is the stuff of which films are made. His true life characters and their tales of conscious or barely conscious lives living on the border of life and death, and the heartbroken families having to make decisions about their care is at once fascinating, titillating, and provocative. When Dr. Owen pushes forward the boundaries of science, he shockingly discovers that a sizable number of patients previously thought to be vegetative or non-responsive often victims of traumatic brain injuries, strokes, or degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, are actually vibrantly alive, trapped in the gray zone. Through a number of pioneering techniques, Owen is able to affirm that these patients are indeed conscious, and in many cases, he's able to engage in a dialogue with them through a special fMRI scan facilitated language system, an enlightening account into the gray zone, stirs controversial questions about how to best care for these patients, including ethical and legal implications, and intriguingly probes into what constitutes a satisfying life. Do we underestimate the ability of our brains and our personalities to survive the loss of their physical support systems? Can a consciousness survive even the loss of the body that houses it? What does it mean to be alive? Adrian Owen is currently the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Cognitive Neuroscience and Imaging at the Brain and Mind Institute, Western University, Canada. He has spent the last 20 years pioneering breakthroughs in cognitive neuroscience. Among the media outlets featuring Dr. Owen's research are the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New Yorker, Nature Science, and the New England Journal of Medicine. Let's talk. So I start reading this book. I can't put it down. Read it for cover to cover. Fabulous, fabulous book. And I have to tell you, this is really, truly fascinating stuff. You're a neuroscientist. Explain exactly what that is. I'll bet you a lot of people think they know what a neuroscientist is. But by definition, what what's your job? Well, actually, I'm a, I'm a particular type of neuroscientist. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. And that really means that I'm interested in the relationship between the brain and behavior. I mean, some neuroscientists work at a much more basic level, sort of examining cells and trying to work out how neurons fire in the brain and these sorts of things. I work at a much higher level than that, if you like. I'm interested in how it is that the brain inside our head allows us to think, to plan, uh, to lay down memories, to make decisions, uh, and these sorts of things. And it's that field or that particular branch of neuroscience is generally referred to as cognitive neuroscience these days. So let's talk the gray zone. How would you define the gray zone? And, and if you will address the vegetative state within the confines of your answer. So I think of the gray zone as being anywhere between where you and I are right now, and that is fully awake and fully aware, and the other end of that spectrum where you are completely unaware of anything. And the reason that vegetative state patients sit right in the center of the gray zone is because they are often referred to as awake but unaware. And that is unlike 
say, coma patients, vegetative patients will open their eyes. They have sleeping and waking cycles. I mean, they, they, they'll fall to sleep sometimes. They'll wake up at other times. They'll even move a little bit. They grunt and groan. So they're, they're very much sort of awake. Uh, yet the assumption has always been that they have no awareness, no awareness of where they are, who they are, and the situation that they're in. And what we've shown over the last 20 years or so is that actually some of them do have some levels of awareness and some of them are very much aware and have even been able to to communicate with us using some of our brain scanning techniques. So this is why I put them in the gray zone because it's really not clear where they are on that spectrum of full from full awareness to no awareness at all. To people like myself, the brain, it, it's a conundrum. Uh, how about for you? Uh, is, it, is it one of the last frontiers? Is it true that for all we know, there is that much more that we don't understand? Talk to me about the brain. I think the brain is extraordinarily complex. And, you know, on the one hand, while I would say, you know, we really know very little about how that sort of three pound lump of gray and white matter inside our heads gives rise to every thought and emotion and feeling that, that we've ever had. If I look back over the last 20 years in neuroscience, I think we've made extraordinary process, uh, extraordinary progress in, in understanding the brain. We know so much more now than we used to. And I mean, if we just take one simple example, and that's the, 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 really the, 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 the focus of the book, this idea that patients who are in the gray zone or are in a vegetative state have no awareness or no sense of, of, of where they are and who they are. 20 years ago, that was very much what we all thought. Everybody thought, well, their brains are so severely damaged, they can't possibly have any residual feelings, thoughts, emotions um, or memories. And in fact, now we know that that's very much not the case. That, that whole area has been completely overturned in what is a relatively short period of time. And the reason why that's been overturned is because we know so much more about the brain, uh, how the brain works, uh, and what goes wrong when you have very serious brain damage. I think brain and I think com uh, computer. Do you? I don't know why. I just always um, have. Well, I, I think in many ways there are lots of useful analogies that one can make between a brain and a computer. And, but really, for me, that's just a way for us to, to, to talk about what it is that the brain does. Um, if we're talking about memory, for example, it's sometimes useful to use a computer as an analogy for some types of memory that, that the brain is capable of doing. But the brain clearly is built in a very, very different way to a computer uh, and in that sense I think the you know the analogy breaks down so I think at a sort of functional level it, it can be useful but in terms of understanding the brain relating it to a computer I think you know is, is not actually going to tell us how the brain works. We think brain we think mystery maybe not so much with an arm or a leg but when we think brain right don't we all think mystery? Mystery. Mystery like a mystery it's a mystery not to you. <laughs> um, the, well <laughs> well so this is actually part of my, I would, I would say this, whether the brain is a mystery or not is, is sort of part of the, the crusade, I think, that I, I feel that I'm on. And this is something that I really tried to illuminate in, in the book because, you know, I've been writing scientifically for 25 years now. I write papers in scientific journals about how the brain works. And I thought it really is about time that somebody writes a book for the general public that explains to them what we know and what we don't know. You know, and the, and the idea was to put many of the most mysterious things about the brain uh, to rest. And one of them is that it's a complete mystery because, you know, it isn't. There's a lot that um, we do know. And, you know, one of the things that I really tried to get across in the book is that, um, and this is a, a theme that I return to many times, is that we are our brains. I mean, many, many people, I don't think, realize that every thought we have, every emotion we have, every plan we make, every person we've loved, it, this is all coming from inside our heads. This is not something that comes from our bodies. It's in our brains. In that sense, you're right, the brain is a complete mystery because it's incredible, incredible that every experience that we've ever had is generated by our brain. But on the other hand, as I've said, we know so much more about it now than we did even uh, two decades ago. It's not pre-programmed. That's another argument that people like to get into. And by the way, let me, let me give you, before you go f forward on that answer, I want to say this to you. You did write a book that is eminently readable 
and fascinating for all us crazy laymans to understand. I got to give you applause on that. It's gripping. It's absolutely Thank you gripping. Very much. You're quite welcome. I thought I had to say that though. But l- let's go back to that thought that I said previous to that. And and I- is there pre-programming or or there's something else that because how are we all so different with this one? What did you call it? Three pound blob. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, <laughs> the um, I mean. I mean, that's the amazing thing about the brain. I mean, there obviously are aspects of brain function that are pre-programmed and there are aspects of brain function that, that are learned. Uh, you know, again, going back to the mystery of the brain, things like, um, you know, how, how your heart beats, how we breathe, how we swallow, all of these functions that many people think of as being bodily functions, these are all controlled by the brain. And all of that stuff is, is pre-programmed. We don't have to learn to swallow or learn to have a heartbeat or, you know, learn to, to, to breathe. That, that stuff is all, it all comes in the startup package, if you like. But then, you know, think about the way that we learn through, uh, you know, through life, the way that we say acquire language, the way that we, some of us acquire the ability to play a musical instrument. All of these things are learned. And somebody who has, uh, who has learned to play the guitar will obviously be better at playing the guitar than somebody, than somebody who's never had that exposure. So in that sense, you know, the brain is plastic. That's, you know, a, a term that's often used. By that, we mean that, that the, uh, it can be applied to, uh, you know, in, in many, many different directions to acquire many different skills. And if you think about, you know, everything that, every experience that you ever have in life, it's, it's inevitable then with a plastic brain that all of us are going to end up being really quite different at the end of the day, even though we may have started off being somewhat, somewhat similar in, in whatever it is that came with the startup package. So cognition, cognitive ability, consciousness, at, at what level of brain function are we considered conscious? So when we talk about cognition, or when we talk about the sort of cognition that I'm interested in, we're talking about, in a way, the sort of highest functions of the brain. It's not the best term, really, but that's that's one that we often use. And by that, we mean our ability to predict the future. And I don't mean in a sort of magical, mystical way, but I mean that, you know, if I kick a ball, I know I've got a good idea of where that ball is going to go. I, I can see where it's going to go. And that's based on the experiences that I've had in the past and various computations that my brain is able to do relating to how how uh, hard I kick the ball, um, how good I am at playing soccer, and so on and so forth. So these these cognitive functions are involved in prediction. They're involved in planning for the future. They're involved in drawing on experiences from our past in order to inform decisions that we might be making today. Problem solving is another higher cognitive functions. And the reason I think these are often referred to as higher cognitive functions is because these are the things that best distinguish us from other other species. And that doesn't mean that other species don't lay down memories. Of course they do. It doesn't mean that other species necessarily can't predict the future in some way because they, they, they certainly can. But, you know, in general, they're not as good at those sorts of things as we are. Whereas much more basic functions like seeing and hearing, um, other species are actually equally as good and in many cases much better than we are at uh, those things. But these sort of higher cognitive functions are the ones that really distinguish us uh, as human beings. And those are the, the areas of brain function that I'm personally most interested in. So before I get into some some of the um, uh, the depth of this, I want to ask you this: in in exploring this this subject of consciousness, the gray zone, aren't we really investigating? And I think you actually say this in the book: what it means to be alive. I think so. I mean, I think it, we're investigating really what it means to be human, and that goes back to my, my my last comment: what is it that distinguishes us from other species? Uh, what is it that distinguishes us from you know various stages in our life cycle? What is the difference between the way that um, a newborn baby perceives the world and the way that an adult perceives the world. Clearly, you can give them both exactly the same experience, if you like, but how they will consciously relate to that will be you know, entirely different. So, yeah, I mean, these are the sorts of areas that I, I tried to cover. Another title that I could have used is, you know, what is it like to be me? Because I'm fascinated by what it's like to be somebody in the gray zone. What is it like to be a newborn child? What is it like to be somebody who has Alzheimer's disease? And, and why is that different than what it is like to be me now? 
Uh, that's a fascinating question. Wouldn't you love to get into somebody else's head for just five seconds? And you kind of are the closest, I think, who's ever done that uh, by the work that you've done. Listen to me on this. How you got into this is just as fascinating as, as the, the, the the length and the breadth of the conversation you have in your book. But talk to us about Kate. She was pretty much the first one that you really got into, right? Yeah. So Kate was interesting uh, in that it was very sort of serendipitous moment for me. I'd been training as a cognitive neuroscientist. I had a lot of experience in some of the the earliest brain scanning or brain imaging techniques that were coming on the scene in the sort of early to mid 1990s. And I was really looking for a way of applying that knowledge, applying that that expertise. And uh, one of my colleagues uh, back in, in Cambridge in the UK introduced me to Kate. She was in a vegetative state and had been for several months. An unusual virus had attacked her brain. Um, and she was entirely non-responsive. She would open her eyes. Uh, she would appear to look around the room. Uh, but she wouldn't, if you asked her to squeeze your hand, she wouldn't do it. If you said blink your eyes, you wouldn't do it. Wiggle your toes. She wouldn't do anything. Completely non-responsive. And that's the sort of classic cluster of symptoms that we associate with the vegetative state and we thought well why, why don't we just put her into a scanner and, and and see if we can see anything and you know this is almost 20 years ago to the month actually 20 years ago this month and it, it was it was a really it was a very strange thing to do back then because nobody believed that we would see anything this patient was in a vegetative state there should be no brain function at all and I got Kate's family to give me pictures of her the family and, and friends and we showed Kate these pictures while she was lying in the scanner and the amazing thing is that the part of Kate's brain that we know is responsible for recognizing faces lit up in exactly the same way that your brain would light up or my brain would light up if we were in the scanner looking at pictures of our friends and relatives and that again 20 years ago almost to the day that was the first evidence that we had that any of these patients were anything other than completely at that dark end of the spectrum, completely unaware of anything going on around them. Kate's brain was amazingly responsive. And in fact, you found out that as many as 20% of the patients that people think are in a pure vegetative state are able to communicate at some level, correct? Well, that's right. I mean, and that was, that was really another 10 years work. Uh, and that's the sort of story that I weave through the book is how we moved on from Kate to uh, scan many other patients uh, and try and work out what it meant. You know, what does it mean to see brain activity in a patient who's vegetative? And about halfway through the book, I come to the point in, in, in uh, 2006 where for the first time we were absolutely conclusively able to make contact with one of these patients. And this was a patient who appeared like Kate to be completely vegetative, but actually this person was completely conscious, completely, if you like, locked inside their head. And as you say, we went then went on to start to communicate with some of these patients, developing techniques for them to communicate with us by changing their pattern of brain activity. This is the way the story unfolds in, you know, in, in, in the book. Eventually, it became apparent that about 20% of these patients have some consciousness, some awareness of, of where they are. Some of them uh, have existed in that place, in the gray zone, for decades, uh, aware of every conversation that's gone on around them, every person that's visited them, every decision that's been made uh, on their behalf. I have to go forward, but I have to stop too, because I have to say to you, first of all, you're talking about the fMRI, which was the early way that you did it. I know that you have a different method now, but you're a genius creating the yes and no language systems that you used with the... Um, you know, mapping out so that you could see whether there would be a response with the tennis game in their head. But the one that got me was the Alfred Hitchcock film. Do talk about that briefly. That's just genius. You and Alfred. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, he's the genius. Alfred Hitchcock you know, is absolutely the master of suspense. And, you know, it turns out that he's very good. His films are very good at allowing us to detect uh, awareness in the vegetative state. And that was I mean, that's some of our uh, more recent work. And it, again, the reason I described this in the book is that I really wanted a lay audience to sort of understand a little bit about the adventure of doing science. You know, some of the decisions that we make, we end up really doing, I think, quite what might seem to be quite wacky things but when when you lay them out and explain them it all it all becomes very clear in the case of alfred hitchcock his movies unlike many modern and i would say inferior movie makers alfred hitchcock uses many techniques that really engage the brain you often have to guess what's going to happen next in order to feel the suspense in a hitchcock movie you often have to get into the mind of, of somebody 
on the set who's making a decision, maybe doing something mean, setting up uh, a trap for somebody, these sorts of things. And, and these are all the processes in the brain that we as humans are best at. We're really good, as I've already said, at predicting the future. And, uh, you know, and that's one thing that is absolutely central to many of Hitchcock's great movies. Foreshadowing is the word that's used in, in the movie industry, which is that something happens that you know is going to mean something important later on. And if you can follow a movie like that, if you can understand and follow the plot of a movie, our argument, and I lay this out in the book, is that you can follow the plot of your own life then. And by scanning patients watching Alfred Hitchcock movies, we found that we were able to detect those who were conscious because we could show from the way that their brain was following the twists and turns in the, in the, in the Hitchcock movie, um, we knew that they were experiencing the movie in much the same way that you or I would. And in that sense, we could conclude, hey, they're not in a vegetative state. They're actually experiencing this movie in a conscious way. And if they're experiencing this movie, then my argument is they're experiencing their own lives. Extraordinary. Talk to me about this moment, the moment you discovered that they were there, that they were cognitive, that they were trapped. For you, what was that moment like? I think there have been many moments like that in my career. And in a way, that sort of provided the, the, the structure or the framework, if you like, for the book. Uh, and, you know, and again, I, looking back over the 20 year story, it was great to be able to sort of re-experience what it felt like. I mean, when I remember vividly sitting, looking at Kate's brain 20 years ago and being absolutely gobsmacked that this activity had occurred at all. We had no idea back in 1997 what that meant, but it was incredible that this patient who could do nothing, who could respond to nothing, was nevertheless generating brain activity in response to pictures of her, her family and friends. And, you know, again, 2006, the first time we put a patient in the scanner, and in that case, we said to her, if you can hear us, imagine you're playing a game of tennis. And immediately her brain lit up. And again, this was a woman who had been in entirely non-responsive for five months. She'd, she'd been lying in bed, uh, eyes open, uh, but making no responses to the outside world at all. And in the scanner, we said, imagine playing tennis now. And at that moment, you know, her brain lit up. In fact, the, the exact part of her brain that I would have predicted would have, uh, would have lit up, if you like. That's what happened. And it was tremendously exciting. I mean, really quite amazing. And then dial forward a few more years. First time we actually communicated with a patient. Again, I, I've got a whole chapter about this in the book. But asking a patient a yes or no question, like, you know, are, are you in any pain? And having them be able to transmit the answer to us by changing their pattern of brain activity, it still amazes me today. I've been working in this area for 20 years and I still get really excited about it. It's, it's absolutely extraordinary. But sorry, long answer to your question, but there have been many, many moments uh, uh, of complete amazement and astonishment in my career. No, you gave me the answer I wanted. It was filled with enthusiasm. And I think that's exactly what I wanted for people to understand because this stuff is just amazing, amazing. Uh, Nothing dull here. Absolutely phenomenally uh, engaging. But you know, you brought you brought something up. The question, right? You, you make the contact. Do you really want to know the answer? Are you in pain? Have you been trapped in pain for you know ten years, twenty years, whatever it was? Do you want to die? You had to think twice about the questions that you would even ask, right? Who oh, of course. To, yeah, um, right. talk we, to me about that. What well, well, we, we, we still do, and we do have to think very carefully about these questions because you know I think there's no point in not asking them unless you know what you're going to do with the answer. Uh, and you know, people very often you know jump right in and say, "Well, great, we can ask these patients if they want to live or die." But you know, until we have an ethical framework work in place to, to you know to, to actually allow us to make the appropriate decisions and, and act on uh, any answer we might get I think you know those questions need to be uh, you know need to remain unasked I mean just more generally though I, I think it is really important that we we do uh, both identify and communicate with these patients because you know beyond the really big questions like do you want to die there are very simple things that we can do to make these patients lives more comfortable like asking them if they're in pain asking them how they want to spend their time do they want to listen to the music that they they've been 
listening to? Do they want to, you know, watch the TV shows that they, they you know, they, they're being exposed to? These sorts of things. I think we can we can do a lot to improve a patient's quality of life. And at the end of the day, you really have to think about it. What you're really doing is just that. You're it's a new medical protocol that you have. You're going to get into where you'll be able to help these people uh, in ways that nobody would have ever thought you could before your your brilliant work. Another thing I want to just you're not just treating the patient, which I thought was interesting because you really are treating the family as well because the family is as much a part of this whole process. And I was just bowled away, by the way, about how I want you, I'll use the word intuitive, but you may have a better word. Family is about where their loved one actually is, whether it's wishful thinking or it's they have a sixth sense or a you know familial sense to be able to say, no, no, they're there. You people may not see it, but we do. That that happened over and over and over again. And a lot of times they were right. It did. Yeah. And, and this is this is very interesting. It does happen very, very frequently, you know, but of course, you know, family gets to spend so much more time with their loved one than, than we ever do or, or the patient's doctor ever does. And uh, I think that, you know, that does that 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 level of experience and exposure to the patient and the things that they do or don't do and the, the responses they maybe make or don't make gives the family that extra edge that very, you know, very often they'll say to us, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely sure he's still in there somewhere. And sometimes we put the patient in the scanner and lo and behold, they're right. The patient is in there. It isn't always the case. In not every not every case turns out like that, but it, 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 it but it has happened. You know, on a number of occasions that I, that I describe in the book, that the patient is absolutely right, and they, in that sense, they completely defy any of the you know professionals who have assessed the patient over the years. Yeah, and I find that fascinating. But I, I, here's something I want to talk to you about, and this is this is one of the weird parts. You mentioned this in the book, I know, but you don't go into great depth. But this just shook me. Modern medicine. A lot of the people are in the gray zone because of modern medicine, because years ago, though, uh, some, a stroke victim wouldn't have been given, you know, life support to keep them going through the nightmare of it to wind up in the calamity that they're in the gray zone, right? So there's a lot of ethical that's stuff right. that's going on in, in, in all of this. And that's one aspect of the ethics that uh, I think we should talk about briefly. Yeah, I mean, it's true. This is a population of patients that we've essentially created over the last half half century or or so, uh, you know, before the advent of, of so-called life support systems, most of us, if we had a catastrophic brain injury, would just die. But of course, we're capable of keeping people's hearts going, keeping their lungs going, and essentially, you know, keeping you know keeping them alive. And you know, this has created a situation where some of these patients survive for or, or en- enter the grey zone and, and remain in that situation for, uh, as I say, sometimes for, for, for decades. Maybe that seems like a bad thing the way I framed it there, but you know. You, know, you have to remember that survival rates and recovery rates are, are so much better than they ever were before. Not everybody ends up in the, in the gray zone. It's really just the unfortunate ones. And, you know, the, the, the flip side of this, the great thing about all these advances in modern medicine is that many people do come back. People who would have died half a century ago survive the worst of times. And I think that's that's the real feel-good message here. Yeah, but you could also say, I, uh, I suspect, that, that along with that kind of thinking and the ethics of it, you know, we are, we're in a new frontier here. <laughs> you know, there aren't answers to everything yet. So, you know, maybe that's it. Is there a God factor in all of this, though, for you? Or are you pure science? Oh, I'm purely science. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm an I'm absolutely a, 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 an imper, an empiricist. I I measure things. I ask questions. I I go through my life like everybody else. I see things in the world and I wonder about how they work and why they are. And then I go back to my lab and I I work out a way of testing it. And that's what that's what I do. That's what I enjoy doing. Uh, you know, and that's that's what really. Um, that's what really drives me. So a good, a good part of this is also the adaptability of humans. And I think you were surprised to find that the answers you might have gotten to your questions about, do you want to live? Do you want to die? Are you okay? Are you in pain? That it seems that these people have adapted to the situation that they're in quite uh, readily, which is uh, something humans are, are, are quite good at doing in all sorts of circumstances that aren't always optimum. Is that correct? It's true. And I think that's a, something that many people listening to this would be surprised by, I think, that um, I think most of us think of this as being a fate worse than death. But actually, the, the best evidence that we have suggests that most of these patients don't want to die, uh, you know, and, and, and many of them actually report achieving some level of, of satisfaction with, with the life that they have. But, you know, as you say, human beings are tremendously adaptable. Uh, and I think this is, is the ultimate testament to that fact. So last point I want to make, after all that you've researched and learned about the gray zone, I'm curious about you, Dr. Adrian Owen. Would you rather live or die if you found yourself trapped in the zone? 
<laughs> well, I'm not going to answer that question um, because uh, th- this was this was the this was the dilemma I posed uh, in the book, which is that I think the most important thing is that we shouldn't presume to know what we would want to happen to us because you can't know what it's like in the gray zone until you get there. So my answer to you would be. What I would want to happen is for somebody to put me into a scanner, try and verify whether or not I was aware, try and communicate with me and ask me what my wishes are then. Because I think in many of these cases, people's opinions about what they want to happen to them will be different when they're in the gray zone than when they're walking, talking, going about their jobs, living a happy life beforehand. And I think I'm no exception to that. And That's what I would want to happen to me. I would want somebody to make every effort that they could to work out what I want then rather than what my prior wishes were. Okay, but I have to ask you this because in the wake of all of the stuff that becomes public information, baby Charlie Gard in the UK, Terry Schiavo, uh, Karen Ann Quinlan's story, I know that you were in on the uh, Prime Minister uh, Ariel Sharon's case at one point. I have to ask you what at the end of the day, should it be the doctors who are making the decisions about this? If possible, the patient making, the family. What's your thought on that? Do you have one? Yeah, I think ultimately we should try and return as much of the decision making as possible to the patient. And in a way, that's really what drives this whole program. And this is a, this program of research in, in that no one is better equipped to make a decision about their future than that, that person themselves. And I think in the absence of that being a possibility, yep, we have a system where we have substitute decision makers. and But that's a very difficult and painful process for those people to, to go through. And I think wherever possible, we should return whatever we can uh, in terms of decision making to the patient themselves. I've been speaking with Dr. Adrian Owen. His book, Into the Gray Zone, a neuroscientist explores the border between life and death. For more information on Dr. Owen and his book, visit intothegrayzone.com. You are listening to The Helly Caster Jane Show. My guests today are Dr. Adrian Owen, author of Into the Gray Zone, and Dr. Edmund Alexander, author of Proof of Heaven. Tune in to The Hallie Kesser Jane Show at HallieKesserJane.com. We'll be back in a minute. Stay with us. A message from the American Podcast Council. Hey, everybody, gather around the piano. Oh, All hey, right. Hey, what you listening to? Podcasts. How can I listen to podcasts? Here, let me show you. Real fast, it's easier than baking a cake. Well, I should hope so. Hey, you know there's nothing on earth like a genuine, bona fide, electrified three-part podcast? Yeah. That's right. And it seems today in our troubled world, most people don't know what a podcast is. No. It's true, but you know. Got one in your ear right now. Sure do. So please, help me out. Show your friends and neighbors how to cast a pie. Okay. Then tell the world about your favorite show using hashtag tripod. That's T-O-Y-P-O-D with a capital T and that rhymes with P and you know what that stands for. Podcast. Hashtag tripod. That's T-R-Y pod. Dr. Eben Alexander is a renowned academic neurosurgeon who has spent 54 years honing his scientific worldview. Having practiced 15 years at the Brigham and Women's and the Children's Hospitals and Harvard Medical School in Boston, he thought he knew how the brain and mind worked. And then the doctor became the patient when Dr. Alexander's own brain was attacked by a rare illness. The part of the brain that controls thought and emotion and in essence makes us human shut down completely. For seven days he lay in a coma. And just as his doctors considered stopping treatment, Dr. Alexander's eyes popped open. He'd come back to life, but only after he had experienced a transcendental near-death experience, an NDE. He told a story in the controversial New York Times bestseller, Proof of Heaven, a neurosurgeon's journey into the afterlife, which remained a bestseller for over 67 weeks. Alexander's second book, The Map of Heaven, How Science, Religion, and Ordinary People Are Proving the Afterlife, was published in October 2014. Alexander once again asserts his belief that there is an afterlife, and that consciousness is independent of the brain. The controversy continues, his assertions questioned in Newsweek, The Atlantic, and explored by Oprah Winfrey and writer Oliver Sacks. 
Let's talk. So boy, oh boy, what's that old saying that God doesn't give you more than you can handle? The scientist takes on the stalwart beliefs of the scientific community. Could you have imagined the blowback that you've gotten from this? And you went against your own scientific community and they pounded you, questioned you on every level, tried to destroy your career. I mean, yikes. And I'm so glad, listen to me, that you're here to talk about this such an important book. What a story. Talk to me. Well, I think it's very important for people to understand, uh, as much as you say, oh, the scientific community has gone after me. Uh, in fact, I would say that the leading edges, uh, the most brilliant investigators in the scientific community, uh, and that is certainly those who are far along the pathway of trying to understand the profound mystery of consciousness itself, many of those scientists fully support me. So really, the only attacks have come uh, from materialist scientists who are addicted to pure physicalism or scientific materialism, um, and from a handful of kind of pseudo-skeptic pseudoscientists who don't know the first thing about consciousness. So the world is waking up to this, and that includes a waking up that's happening all through the scientific community, and it's really only the, the kind of uh, fringe of less educated and more simplistic uh, thinking people who have no idea about the mystery of consciousness, uh, they're the ones who might come out and attack me. Okay, great. And I'm glad that we've got that squared away because I think that's important. But let's before we really get into the heart of this, let's go back a bit. And for those who don't know, you were a practicing neurosurgeon, you became sick, and then you had your near-death experience um, and what we now call NED, NDE. Share with us exactly what you saw and felt. Well, it, uh, it all started um, in a very primitive course, uh, unresponsive realm. Um, important to point out that my memories of my life, everything of Evan Alexander's uh, life memories were completely gone when I was deep in this uh, journey. And so it started in what I call the earthworm's eye view, a very uh, um, coarse realm. But then I was rescued from that by a slowly spinning white light that took me up into a brilliant gateway valley that was loaded with beautiful, idyllic, earth-like features, beautiful flowers, butterflies, uh, lots of souls dancing below and angelic choirs above. And then from that realm transcended up into higher and higher realms all the way out to what I call the core, uh, that realm of, of oneness, of, of you know, completely outside of all of eternity infinity. I mean, this one has to completely start over again in the understanding of how the world is put together uh, to get this. And yet, the getting of it is perfectly consistent with the uh, extreme mystery facing those who are trying to unravel the phenomenon of consciousness itself. So that's what this is really very much about. But you can't come up with uh, simple little patches and band-aids to try and put this into our general worldly understanding. The only way to really make sense of it is to go to, back to square one and, and rework our kind of worldview of how this universe works. And that includes... Things like going uh, deeply into the measurement problem in quantum mechanics, realizing that each and every one of us has never experienced anything other than the inside of our own consciousness. Uh, and that, of course, is a, a profound truth. Uh, it's a fact. It's not even arguable that uh, the only thing we've ever known is our own consciousness. And the world, the mind and brain are so good at convincing us that what we're experiencing is the world out there. But in fact, no human being has ever experienced anything other than a model within mind of what we presume is the world out there. And it's this whole deeper understanding that I think is uh, shaking this world right to its foundations. Kim, is it fair to say there was nobody more shocked than you? <laughs> well, I would, you know, as I, I put it, when I came back to this world, my doctors were right. My brain was devastated. So when I first started to wake up after seven days in coma from meningitis, which uh, had de destroyed the neocortex, the outer part of my brain, the human part. When I first came back, I remembered nothing at all of Evan Alexander's life before coma. I had no words or language. I didn't even recognize my, my mother, my sisters, my sons standing around the bedside. I had no idea who these beings were. And, of course, initially, in the first few weeks of trying to figure it all out, I thought, well, given the, the damage to my neocortex... Uh, and do remember, it took about eight weeks for all my knowledge of brain-mind consciousness to come back to me after awakening from coma. So in those early weeks, I didn't even really remember what I knew about brain-mind consciousness. 
But my doctors told me that I was way too sick with too much devastation to my neocortex to have been able to have experienced anything. And that, of course, was the really deep mystery. And uh, as it all came back to me, I started realizing that this was much more than just a trick of the dying brain. As I told my older son, who was majoring in neuroscience in college at the time, my experience was way too real to be real, which to me meant it had to be some kind of hallucination or drug effect. But it was only in the months after that, reviewing my medical records, talking with the doctors who took care of me, that I realized that there was too much damage to my neocortex for me to even have any kind of rich uh, hallucination or drug effect or you know, kind of dream state. None of that was left because of the damage to my neocortex. And that's what was such a beautiful gift. Because I remembered fully that glorious journey that I describe in the book that happened to me deep in coma. And our conventional neuroscience would very plainly state none of it could have happened at all. But given that it did happen, we then had to understand it. And that's where I think the book's Proof of Heaven and the Map of Heaven help to take people along on the journey of why this is such a deep mystery. Right. You saw God or felt God or absolutely experienced God fully. Wow. Uh, and that is what I describe in that book. But of course, you know, in our Western culture, we have no remote concept of being able to have conscious identity with an infinitely powerful, all loving, creative source. And yet so many near death experiencers for thousands of years from all different cultures, whether they were atheists or had any number of religions, come back with stories that are very similar that paint a universal picture of that infinitely loving deity at the core of all of existence. And yes, I experienced that in its full-blown, astonishing, and absolutely indescribable joy, just as have many millions of near-death experiencers throughout history. And they all bring this same thing back. So I'm certainly not alone with this experience. So aren't and, you, I'm going to interrupt. Aren't you mad that you had to come back? <laughs> No, we're no. all here for a reason. That was another benefit of my journey was I got to uh, really see kind of the grander scale of how all this is put together and why. Uh, and we are here now to learn these lessons of infinite uh, healing power of unconditional love, to love ourselves and love all our fellow beings. This is the lesson that is incumbent on us to learn as, uh, you know, all of consciousness of the universe is evolving towards that, and all of humanity and all of life on Earth needs to be part of that evolution. So we're here for a reason. Okay, so let's take this title of yours, Heaven. I'm interested in the fact that what you experience you call Heaven. I don't want to take that for granted, because I want to, why Heaven, not Hell, not Purgatory, Heaven? Well, I would say, you know, that title was basically from the publisher. What my book and my story is an absolute shocking proof of is that our souls are not limited with the death of the physical body, and that consciousness is not created by the brain. In fact, I've had many people tell me that my book is so much more than just a simple little proof of heaven. And I think when you get where that's really going and kind of see it at that level, which so many people do see, then we know where we're going with this. And uh, all I'm pointing out is that these experiences are not hallucinations at all. They're actually glimpses into a much more fundamental reality that is the home of our souls and is much more real than this material world. And that is something that's so crucial to get. Now, the fact that the vast majority of people who visit that realm, no matter what their religious beliefs, and they can be very atheistic before it happens, but when they come back, they know something very different, and that is that at the core of this universe, at the core of our very conscious existence, our spiritual reality is of an infinitely loving oneness that we all share. And so that is really what the book is proof of. And it's proof of that in a very solid fashion. The thing it is not proof of is anyone's dogmatic interpretation of religion that limits the view of what that eternal spiritual existence is all about. So in other words, I like to say that Proof of Heaven helps to uh, lift us above the false dogma of separation, whether that is a dogma of the various religions, because I was contacted by the mystical practitioners of all the great religions to tell me how my journey uh, was so consistent with their most ancient texts and readings and understanding. The thing to, under to really get here is the dogma is very misleading, and the dogma of separation that many of our religions try and put out there. And this also includes the dogma of separation 
that tries to pretend that this is discussion between you know religion and science and that one of those is right and the other is wrong. In fact, what I came to see is that science and spirituality move forward together. There's no way either one of them can move forward alone. And in, in detail here, point out that the deep uh, mystery of the measurement problem in quantum mechanics is an impasse that the materialist scientific community will never move beyond uh, until they realize that consciousness, soul, spirit, and the divine are fundamental in the running of this universe. I think that, so this is really about rising above all that false dogma and separation. Right. There, and, there, and there is this, too. If, if, if the scientific community and the spiritual community can't get together on this, they're failing us. Well, they're failing themselves. Well, they're also uh, failing I us. I promise you. Well, the, yes, they are. The materialist scientific community is doomed as it stands anyway, and that's why it's spent more than 100 years struggling with that measurement problem in quantum mechanics, trying to interpret it properly, uh, where the answer is, uh, in my mind, is quite clear, that you start to realize that that uh, that soul or spirit consciousness is fundamental. It creates the entire universe. This whole material realm emerges out of that. Uh, and when you realize that, you start to realize the basis of our spiritual beliefs and that they have a tremendous basis in fundamental reality. Uh, material science is what fails. It fails itself. So, you know, I'm not worried moving forward as we get closer to truth. Materialist scientists will have to be have to abandon that pure materialism because it does not work. This and is likewise, all, yeah. I think the spiritual community uh, grows tremendously by realizing the lessons of materialist science that, in fact, there's no material to the material world. It's vibrating strings of energy in higher dimensional space time or what have you, but it's not at all what it appears to be to us down in this material realm in our physical incarnation. Let me talk to you about this as well, because really isn't this a book of faith proof? You have proof in the title, but you know faith... There is no proof. Well, except that this is about the strongest proof about any of this that you will encounter anywhere in our thinking. And, and in other words, this is consistent with so many other uh, deep thinkers throughout history, uh, spiritual leaders, prophets, mystics over all ages. And that includes those who are deeply into understanding consciousness and the phenomena of the world that we live in. This is a system of thinking that makes much more sense than anything else that I am aware of. Oh, I didn't uh, say that to dispute what you're saying. I said that because I think faith is a wonderful thing. <laughs> well, it is, but uh, I mean, the deepest reality here is no one can ever be certain of anything. Exactly. Uh, and proof, proof does not exist in science. Proof exists in mathematics. Uh, but it's uh, very erroneous to even think that you have scientific proof. The scientific method is a way of getting towards truth. Um, and I must point out here, very crucial, hmm. that so much of the knowledge we gain in this world cannot come out of a strictly applied scientific method. And, and that, is, that is such a myth uh, that you must have the scientific method to believe anything. In fact, there are some things, especially around the phenomenon of consciousness itself, because of its very deep intrinsic nature in our very being, completely rise above any possibility of ever being proven through, it, through the scientific method alone. But anecdotal experience, and in fact I would say all of human experience, is what we need to base our notions of reality on. And our pursuit of truth needs to take all the available information. Let me throw something else at you. Fear. I want to take this out to that step. How much does fear play in all of this? Fear of something larger than being in control of it all, fear of dying in the unknown, fear of letting go. It seems to me that it would be easier to make us happier, make our lives better if we were to embrace the reality of an afterlife. Yet we thwart the belief in the concept by nature at every turn. And isn't that to our own detriment? Well, I would say that fear is a tremendous part of the big problem here. Fear uh, for one thing, fear is one of the major tools that the ego has to work with. You know, the ego, our sense of self, uses fear and anxiety, basically anxiety about the past, fear about the future, uh, and that is a tremendous tool. And what I encourage people so much in my talks is to come to realize and remember the eternal and infinitely powerful spiritual beings that we all are, that we're all interconnected as spiritual beings, we're all eternal and that we're all part of that divine. And the more that one comes to realize the truth of all that, and remember that truth from deep within, 
the more one is able to overcome so much of the badness and apparent evil that one encounters in our material realm and in lower spiritual realms. And certainly people can get very hung up uh, in a fear of death. Uh, the evidence and proof of heaven, and especially if you go to my website, evanalexander.com, uh, look at more of the information there, and the scientific information that's emerging uh, with some of the books that I point to, like Irreducible Mind and Beyond Physicalism, I think the day is coming, as Larry Dossie said when he promoted my book, The Map of Heaven, uh, the day is coming because of these kind of books that people who are considered intelligent uh, and intellectual and thoughtful in this world will not doubt at all that we are eternal spiritual beings. They will realize that death is simply a transition, and it's a very akin to birth, and that our soul connections do not end with death of the physical body. And I would say that as we get deeper and deeper into the scientific understanding of consciousness, this worldview is inevitable. Everyone will know this, uh, you know, within the next many decades, uh, uh, in the coming century. This will be common knowledge that we're eternal spiritual beings. The whole materialist paradigm is coming to an end because it's woefully inadequate and has absolutely zero to offer up about the relationship between brain and mind and in consciousness. So this is a coming worldview that is... Uh, I would say inevitable, and it's really the death knell for that simplistic, conventional, uh, scientific pseudo-explanation that I used to think governed reality before my coma. Two quick questions. One is, have you had any other encounters with the other side since? A tremendous number. I, I do a lot of work now with sacred acoustics. Uh, you can go to sacredacoustics.com to learn more, and uh, it's all about meditation. Uh, by going deep into consciousness, each and every one of us can come to know everything that I know from my journey. That's been told to us by deep meditators, Tibetan monks, etc., for thousands of years. They know that we are far more than these physical bodies. Meditation and centering prayer is a great way to get in there. And I use sacred acoustics meditations, which I help to design. I, I use them daily to return to those realms of my journey. And that is, those are realms that are available to each and every one of us who will put in the work you know, do the meditation. And like I say, this is not a quick and easy fix. You don't do three meditations and then decide whether or not it's working. I recommend people do this daily and plan on doing it the rest of your life. But that can help all of us to come to know these truths. The last thing that I want to talk to you about and very quickly is and something I wish there was an answer to, and, and that is why death has been left such a mystery by God or a higher power or whatever you want to call out there. Or has it, and it's only our, that fear that you and I were talking about earlier, that is the reason for our lack of understanding about what happens on the other side while well, we're in this stage this of existence. Of, this, this kind of an understanding is kind of a stepping stone in the evolution of consciousness to, towards a much greater understanding of the nature of reality. Uh, and part of it at, at this point in human development, and, and again, remember that uh, most of the problems we're talking about in terms of not facing death and being confused about death are really peculiar, for the most part, to our Western kind of the 20th century and 21st century materialist scientific culture. And many indigenous cultures have never lost sight of the fact that our souls are eternal and connected. And what I see is this, the great awakening coming to this world is really just kind of returning some of that ancient wisdom and spiritual wisdom that other cultures still have in fairly strong measure and bringing it back into our very impoverished and paltry materialist uh, Western uh, thinking that's lost sight of all of that kind of reality. So this is really about recovering some great wisdom that, of course, before my coma, I was tempted to dismiss as uh, outmoded and now realize that it's just far deeper wisdom than I had in my very simplistic kindergarten level uh, scientific thinking of brain creates consciousness. I was just absolutely wrong. I've been speaking with Dr. Evan Alexander, author of the New York Times bestseller, Proof of Heaven, A Neurosurgeon's Journey into the Afterlife, and The Map of Heaven, How Science, Religion, and Ordinary People Are Proving the Afterlife. For more information on Dr. Alexander, visit his website at evanalexander.com, on Facebook under Evan Alexander MD, and on Twitter, his handle is Life Beyond D. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Hallie Kessler Jane Show, a production of Resec LLC. The Hallie Kessler Jane Show posts new podcasts Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern. 
visit hallikesserjane.com. <laughs>